Is there a more American term? Hometown. The old swimming hall. A yeah, little corny music there. The lovely church on the hill, right? The general store. And the soda fountain. Hometown. We write plays about it. Our town. And everyone knows everyone else. They all love each other. Oh, yes. How American. We all have a hometown in our little old cuddly American hearts, don't we? Sure we do. Right. It's on greeting cards and covers of magazines. Norman Rockwell, Granny Moses. And you look at these and you say, oh, it's just the way it was. Was it? Hometown. <laughs> oh, yes. Would you like to see my hometown the real thing? There it is. Just like the American hometowns that we dream of, isn't it? Where everybody knows everybody else. The old general store is called Marshall Field. Where everyone goes to the barber shop and talks about the gossip of the, of the day. My hometown, lovable. Yes, indeed, Chicago. City of a million parking lots and 17 million cars. And there's the old swimming hole. Stretches a million miles off into the distance. And when I was a kid, so polluted, you could run halfway to Milwaukee before you sank in the bottom of the water there. Chicago, oh my Chicago. Hog butcher for the world, tool maker, stacker of wheat. Uh, we kids had a little parody that said, uh, pig manure, provider to the world, city of the broad hind end. But you know how kids are. Closer to the truth than they want to be. That's Chicago. Yes, there's our neighborhood theater. Yes, indeed. Beautiful. Brings back so many memories, doesn't it? It lies there like a slice of the landscape of the moon. Overgrown with scraggly weeds that drive in. Where I learned many of the facts of life from many girls named Esther Jane. As row upon row of cars squatted in the flickering darkness and listened to William Holden and Jennifer Jones. I feel... Not that I don't like you, for I do. I wouldn't do anything to upset you. Of course not. And that was always the, the signal for everybody to immediately move into action. As soon as William Holden kissed Jennifer Jones, wham! Oh! Yes, and the... Little tin speakers that were never loud enough and always had a hum. And when you drove out of the drive-in after your night of passion, you'd rip the speakers out by the roots, break the side window on your car. And that was, of course, the south side where I grew, but there was a dividing line. In our city, like Gaul, it was divided into parts. There was the south side. And then, the north side. Yes, the hated Northsiders who lived in their little frame houses along Waveland Avenue. The other side of Wrigley Field. Wrigley Field, the home of the Cubs, the dreaded, hated Northside ball team. And, of course, the Cub fans, they were the worst types. Yuppies, that's what the Cub fans were. They didn't know what it was like to live on the south side where life was real, life was earnest. No, indeed. They sat in their cute little yuppie bars and talked cub talk. 
and drank imported beers. Cub fans. Look at that crowd. Five is going to be 4-2. Five threes. Five three Cubs. No problem. The hated Cubs. Why oh, lived on the south side where life was different? Where it rained and snowed and lightning crashed and there sitting in solitary, frightened splendor was Comiskey Park. No yuppie bars here, I can tell you. Yuppie wouldn't last five minutes walking along 35th and Shields, I can tell you that. He'd be stripped like a banana. 35th and Shields. It's a tough neighborhood, kids. And out of those very portals, one time walked shoeless Joe Jackson, a legendary Chicago White Sox outfielder accused of throwing the 1919 Chicago World Series. The World Series! A little kid darted up and said, Say it ain't so, Joe! And that phrase is echoed throughout all of baseball history. It was never said. But it was a White Sox moment. Because the White Sox, the only team in the history of the magic American game, were the only team ever known to have actually thrown a World Series on the dark south side. Comiskey Park. Historic bastion of blasted dreams of, and moments of ecstasy. What a fantastic ballpark. Some of the most important moments of my childhood were spent right here. The upper deck, right field, section G. Always the upper deck. Incidentally, this is also known as the peanut gallery. These are the worst, cheapest seats next to the bleachers in the entire park. But boy, could you see the field from here. Look at just a fantastic vista. Whew. <laughs> Lord. Did I ever tell you about the time my old man personally lost a Chicago White Sox ball game, an official league game. Changed my whole family, changed my whole history of my life. Almost killed the old man. And I've never really wanted to tell this story, but since I'm out here, I just figure I got to do it. Guy's got to get it out of him. You know, you got you to gotta empty your gut sometimes. You know the feeling. And I'm going to do it. I've just got to get it out of my soul. I must have been about eight or nine when it happened. You know, when you're eight or nine years old, you look up to your father, really. My old man was kind of an epic figure to me. You know, he came home from work every day and he drank his bottle of Blatt's beer and he'd sit there at the kitchen table, eat a meatloaf sandwich. He'd open up the sport page of the Chicago Tribune and there would be the headline every night, of, say, socks drop pair to Cleveland. Sox drop pair to Cleveland. It ain't easy to lose two games in one day to Cleveland. But the Sox could do it. As a matter of fact, the Chicago White Sox of my boyhood, May 1st would be 35 games out of first place. They only played 38 games. They'd already be so far down that nobody even could see them down at the bottom of the cellar. And every day it would be like that. But one thing would happen week after week. The old man would come to the ballpark on Sunday. He never missed the Sunday game. He loved coming out here on his day off. He didn't care who they were playing. But the one team he never missed, he would miss his mother's funeral rather than miss a game with the hated, dreaded, evil New York Yankees. He hated the Yankees. I mean hate. I'm talking about hate. And why? They were from New York, for starters. And New York is New York. The old man was from Chicago. And Chicago always has been the second city, friends. Chicago is always envying New York, and New York doesn't even know it's in a fight. And not only that, there was something about the Yankees that got him mad. They had these gray suits. 
They wore tight gray suits with kind of dark blue hats, very understated. And all it said on the front was New York. They weren't fancy. They didn't need fancy suits. The White Sox went for great big letters that said socks all over the front and fancy socks on the hat. Yankees had come out with these little gray suits. They looked like they got them from the Salvation Army. And that used to bug them, the old man, because year after year after year, the Yankees were success. And it began to fester in his soul. I knew it because the White Sox, all through my old man's life, never rose above sixth place. Year after year. But the Yankees would start out the opening day of the season after the second pitch. They'd be 30 games in, in the lead already in the season. And this ballpark during the regular season games would be practically empty day after day. And you'd hear the sound of Bob Elson, the announcer, when you're walking around a neighborhood, his voice is coming out of the radio, and all you'd hear is, he's out. Or you'd hear this. There's a swing. High pop-up. He's out. Typical Chicago White Sox play. The St. Louis Browns would come in. If you think the White Sox were bad, the Browns were almost as bad. And they'd play the Sox twin teams of defeat and disaster. And there'd be 285 fans in the stands. But who would be up here in right field in Section G? The old man. Cleveland would come in. They had a guy named Bob Feller, and Bob Feller would just throw his cap out on the field. The White Sox would surrender. Forget it. But the team that he hated more than anybody else was the New York Yankees, the dreaded Yankees. And for some reason, I can't figure it out, there was one ball player on the Yankees that he more than any other player hated. There was something in the way he walked. He had a kind of arrogant, snotty walk. And he'd walk around first base. He played first base. He'd walk around first base, and he'd sort of swiggle his shoulders a little bit like this, you know. He had this square jaw. And of course, the old man, now that I look back on it, as an ex-kid, I can see the old man's life was one of endless frustration. Nothing ever worked in his life. He never owned a car that was newer than a third-hand Oldsmobile. And down on first base would be that Yankee first baseman that he hated because this guy epitomized the others. You know the feeling I mean? The others, the ones who get in the good nightclubs, the ones who get the great table, the ones who get the tickets to everything, the ones who, at the age of 12, are batting 350. And his name, Lou Gehrig. You ever hear the name? I'll never forget it. And I was only eight or nine. I can remember it so well. And every time that the New York Yankees would come out to Comiskey Park, would make the trip out west, this was the only time the park was filled. There'd be 70,000 people out here. That was half their yearly attendance at this park. They would be here to see the Yankees. And the Sox, game after game, would fall to the Yankees. Of course, it was a pathetic contest, but you could see the Yankees. That's what you went out to see. And he used to bug the old man. And I'll never forget that day when our lives changed at home. You gotta see that the old man's life was hung on baseball. He loved coming out here. And there were others like him that would sit all around here, out in Section G, the regulars, the guys who week after week bought the same seats. The old man always sat in this seat. It's still here, seat 161, Section G. His hind end picked up more slivers from that seat than any other man who ever sat out here in Comiskey Park. This was where he came alive. He'd sit here with a with a container of beer. He'd buy me some peanuts. My kid brother, Randy, would be on the other side of me. He'd be whining, his nose running, and we'd be waiting for the ball game to begin. And the, and the, 
I remember that day that it, that it all happened. Just before the game, the Yankees were taking infield practice. And out there at first base was Lou Gehrig. The stands were filled to overflowing. There must have been 70,000 White Sox fans out here. And it was one of those gray, lowering days that had the sense of disaster written all over. The kind of day that Orestes must have known when Electra sent him across that wine-dark sea to his destiny. Oh, God. I'll never forget it. It was five minutes before the game, and Lou Gehrig was walking over there by first base. You can see it right now. The old man suddenly stood up. Now, remember, the regulars were all around. All of his old friends had watched ball games with him for years. He stood up, and he had this fantastic voice. It's one thing the old man had. He had this beautiful, rich, booming voice, and it only came to full flower at the ballpark. Five minutes before the game began, the old man made his first ploy. Lou Gehrig was down there walking around first base. He was walking towards the dugout because the Yankees were going to bat first. When he let go his first shot, Hey, Gehrig! 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 You New York bum! and echoed throughout the park. Hey, Gary! It echoed out to left You're field, around center field, and back a home plate, a and up bum, the right field York stands, bum, and back Gary. again. You could hear it echoing from the bleachers. You're a bum, Gary, a New York bum. The old man sat down, and the crowd around him applauded. They cheered, because he said it for all of them. And I noticed Gehrig just glanced back over his shoulder, just casually. Because you couldn't miss the old man's voice. I mean, Enrico Caruso wasn't in it with the old man when he was booing. And Gehrig just glanced up coolly and walked towards the dugout. Pitching for the Chicago White Sox that day was the most beloved pitcher of the time. A pitcher named Ted Lyons. Have you ever heard of him? He was a beloved pitcher. I mean, if there was any ball player that was loved on the south side, it was Ted Lyons. Luke Appling at shortstop, he was loved, too. Banana Nose Zeke Benura playing first base. Banana Nose, the only ball player who ever played that had concrete feet. He had concrete feet. He had a fielding range of about six, seven inches, and he was Banana Nose. And Banana Nose would stay down there at first base and holler, let him hit! Let him hit, let him hit. Banana Nose couldn't feel the grapefruit. Well, that's the setting. Poor old Ted Lyons pitched his heart out that day. White Sox had not beaten the Yankees since two seasons before. It was going into the ninth inning. Ted Lyons was pitching a magnificent game. In fact, it was a two-hitter against the Yankees. The Sox were ahead 2-1 to one when Frankie Crosetti singled. Red Rolfe, who was the Yankee third baseman, dropped a bunt down the first baseline and beat it out. Two runs are on base. Sox are leading 2-1. to one. When out of the dugout came Lou Gehrig. Ninth inning, the crowd was hushed because this was it. If they, could, if they could retire the Yankees, they would have beaten the Yankees in a fantastic ball game. And Ted Lyons, the most beloved pitcher on the White Sox, would have won a game pitching a magnificent free hitter against these dreaded evils from New York. Gehrig walked to the plate. Now, he had a very tight stance. He kept his feet fairly close together. He didn't move a lot in the batter's box. He just stood up there, sort of coiled. Ted Lyons had a big sweeping motion. Lyons' first pitch was outside. 
just the shade. It was more one. And the old man's getting excited. The crowd, you know, you hear him rustling because Gehrig was that kind of ball player. He just, he, you either loved him or you hated him. He was moving a little bit to play. He'd move his shoulders. Had giant shoulders, this guy. Had been a football player, by the way, moved his shoulders. Had a, he had a neck, maybe a size 30 collar. Moved his shoulders a little bit. Ted Lyons wound up through the next pitch. Fantastic. Slider just caught the inside of the plate. Strike one. And you could hear the umpire echoing out. I think it was that that did it. It got the old man. That sound of that voice. Maybe he recognized a rival in that umpire's voice. It was an umpire named Summers. Had a fantastic, uh, wonderful voice. Strike! 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 Lou Gehrig stepped out of the box and spit. Ted Lyons looked down at his catcher, who was a catcher named Mike Tresh. Tresh has given him the sign. When suddenly, in that moment of drama, in that moment of quiet, the old man stood up. He just rose up out of his seat. Hey, Gehrig! Hey, Yo! New York Yo! Bob! New hey, Gehrig! Put one up here! Put I dare you! Put one up here, you bum! I dare you! Gehrig, you're a bum! You're a bum! You're a bum! You're a bum! There are moments in men's lives when it all seems to come together. Orestes being told by Electra that she'd better do something. She'd better do something with that old man and he'd better get on the stick and do it. Well, Lou Gehrig just glanced up here to this section. The crowd heard it all over the ballpark. And on the next pitch, which was one of the best fastballs I ever saw Ted Lyon throw, Gehrig swung with that clean, easy, compact, chopping swing. He just swung deep. And you could hear that ball. It just went, clock! You know the sound of a ball being hit seriously? There's a sort of clock. It sounds like clock. It just went, clock. And I'm a little kid. I'm sitting there. And of course, I'm admiring the old man. He was the star of right field. And I'm looking at him as throughout the whole game, every time he would yell and holler, this is my father, this is my old man, oh, I love my old man. Well, this all changed this instant. Gehrig swung. I've never seen anything in my life like it. It was like an approaching jet plane coming out of the darkness down that ball, you know, I played baseball since I was a kid, you know, little pop-ups and that. I, our idea of a pop-up fly was 30 feet, something like that. That ball came straight at us, right at us. It got closer, closer, so quick that the old man couldn't even move. We were all petrified. It roared right up here into right field, and bang, it hit seat number 142. Only a split second before the guy that was sitting in there, one of the old regulars, had dove down into the concrete to get out of the way of it. It hit the back of the seat, such a shot, splinters flew in the air, and that ball just took off and bounced back on the field halfway to the infield. And Garrett just glanced up at the old man as he rounded first on his home run trot. He had the snottiest home run trot you ever saw. Three runs. That was it for the White Sox. Everybody in the stadium looked at the old man. All around us here in right field, there were their faces looking up. Why can't you keep your big mouth shut, you bum? Look what you did! Look what you did! You wrecked Ted Lyons whole season, you bum! The old man is sitting. And I'm sitting next to him. My father. My father, the bum. Nothing was said after that. As the crowd filed out, we got back into the car to go home. 
I remember my mother saying, how was the game? The old man says, oh, I, okay, okay. He'd lost that ball game. It did not appear in the box score, friends. You will not see it in the record books, but there's two kinds of history. There's the kind that's written down, and then there's the kind that really happens. Ted Lyons never pitched as well after that. The old man stopped coming to ball games, except just rarely. I think it changed his life, and I know it changed mine. I never looked at him the same way either. My old man, the bum. Yep. Lots of stuff has happened out here in this great ballpark. of a different nature tomorrow evening when we present the outstanding motion picture My Dinner with Andre. Your one opportunity to see that highly acclaimed movie My Dinner with Andre is at 9 o'clock tomorrow night and the only place to see it is right here on Channel 33.